Because what I put up here um, today is I've got the Dana 44 axle. Let me get this out of the way because it might be interfering with a little bit of that. And after reviewing some of the comments from yesterday, there's a few things I'm going to try to discuss. And I'm also going to uh, um, cover some of the students' questions that I have in my class that they have on worksheets and try to address some of that as we go. But this is a Dana 44 axle. We got these axles years ago from, the, uh, old, from a Chrysler training center. And um, they were done with them, mainly because they were getting rid of the, their, their vehicles. They teach the new stuff, of course. And they were getting rid of the older front axles, the solid front axles, and going to something new. So they had all these Dana 44s that they actually had cut down so that they can store them easier. Well, I do something similar here in the transmissions lab, uh, or in the drivetrains lab, is I don't want to store these huge axles. So we uh, cut the axle shafts down a lot of times. And that I, I, I didn't bring it in here, but I've got a tower of rear axles. So I could put like 15 rear axles on one narrow tower, and it doesn't take up much space. And then we're able to mount it into these mounting fixtures. I, I do realize that's not realistic when you're working on a vehicle, you've got to uh, deal with it in the vehicle. But for when you're going through, uh, you know, 12 of these at a time with a class, that's not practical. So we have these things mounted on the bench. And some people will do it on a bench because you might be re overhauling a unit for uh, an axle exchange or something like that. And if you could build it on a bench, you're better off because it's easier. It's, it's less um, <clears throat> cumbersome. Now, right here, um, as I mentioned yesterday, if you got a chance to watch that stream, if you are working on a vehicle, it, working on this axle assembly in a vehicle, it's always good to leave a couple of these differential case bolts in after you take the caps off. So that way, if something rolls out on you, you got that extra second or so before that thing comes down, crashing on your foot and breaks a toe or chips your concrete or chips the paint here in the, in the tech. We don't want that to happen. So anyway, going back to this, these are Dana 44s. They're also called the 216 RBI. That's what um, Chrysler calls these. And R is, a, or actually this is FBI. F would be front. B would be beam. It's a beam type axle housing, would normally be. And then um, I would be iron. So like an FBA would be a front beam aluminum. And an RBA would be a rear beam aluminum. So they've just got their own um, kind of terming for it. Also, the 216 is referring to the diameter of this ring gear in millimeters. Now, this Dana 44, I believe it's an eight and a half inch diameter ring gear, but um, all these Dana is pretty much set up the same. If we go from a Dana 30, 35, 44, 60, 70, 80. Matter of fact, these tool kits that we'll use, these are the factory tools, but they will work. Matter of fact, if you're going to buy a, a Dana tool kit, these would be the ones because these, these tools will work on all those axles. Um, it'll go from 44 all the way up to Dana 80. And you, there are a couple like other pieces that you'll use with the other size axles, but you'll see when we, um, when we set these up, we'll use the parts that we uh, use just for the Dana 44. Okay, um, uh, if, if you also attended yesterday's live stream, there's a few pre-checks that we do before we disassemble it. One of the things that we're going to do is measure backlash. And here comes a question that the students were asking me on a worksheet that they had to fill out. I, I asked them, what does it mean if you could jiggle, if I can come up to this axle housing, and I can just lay my hand on this and jiggle it back and forth and hear the backlash. I can hear click, 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 click. What that means is that this axle has no side bearing preload. I shouldn't be able to, at any of these axles that I'm done building, I shouldn't be able to just go there and jiggle my hand back and forth and hear the backlash clunking. Like, I'm going to try to do it with this just with force, but... So you might have been able to hear that through my microphone. If I can make that sound just by laying my hand on there and jiggling it back and forth, I already know my, I don't have any side bearing preload. There's got to be clamp on these bearings in order to make um, these, the, this axle housing be secure and positioned correctly. And another confusion that we have uh, that, that the students were having, and they mentioned in the worksheet, is that they um, are still struggling trying to understand the purpose of the preload versus the purpose and, uh, of positioning. And we have shims that are doing both. They're obviously, like on, the side, on this differential case, the shims that we have from side to side are establishing the clamp, the pressure on those bearings, that's the preload, but depending on how many shims we have on either side is going to determine how much backlash we have. 
So if I have on the ring gear side, that's on this side, and pinion side's over here, it's, it seems to be reversed from what I had yesterday. If I had less pinions on this, uh, shims on the ring side and more on the pinion side, I'll have more clearance between the, the uh, ring gear and the pinion gear. There'll be more slop, so I'll hear that and I'll measure more backlash. If I have more shim thickness on this side and less on this side, then it would move the ring gear closer to the pinion and it would be tighter. That's how it adjusts it. Now, depending on overall how many shims, if I add the amount of shims I have on my, uh, my ring gear side and on my pinion side, that would determine how much total shims I have in there. That's going to determine how much pressure I have on those bearings. So um, anyway, we'll, we'll jump into that as we go through this. I'm going to measure real quick our backlash. And uh, yesterday, you guys maybe saw the, um, we measured off of this drive side because it's more, it comes off of this gear a little straighter. So it's a little easier to see what the actual, uh, or it's a little more, it's a better representation of what the movement of the gear is. And these little snakes sometimes take a while to kind of level out, but I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see those numbers. It's another thing uh, I heard yesterday from my good friend Blaine Heisner. He said I zoomed in way too much on a few spots. And you can see I'm about four thousandths. That's not, uh, it's not quite the spec. On this one, it's supposed to be between five and eight thousandths. So we're seeing a contact pattern that is probably a little, little low. Then I'm going to spin it a half of a turn with the pinion or so. I'm going to measure it again. I'm getting four thousandths again. Half of a turn on the pinion. I want to measure at least four spots, but preferably eight. See there, I'm about three and a half, about three and a half. Normally, if you're taking an axle apart, it'll have more backlash. It'll be looser than tighter. And that's about four and a half. So we're between about four and a half and um, uh, what did I say? Three and a half and four and a half. So that's a little tight, but it's not as bad as the one yesterday. The one we had yesterday was like 15 thousandths of an inch. Okay, another thing I'm going to want to do is do a contact pattern. And you can see there's a little bit of, of uh, paint on here already um, because these are lab units. You can imagine these. These are uh, muffler pipes that were stuck in here because of the training center. They cut them off right flush with the ends of the flange, uh, the actual different of uh, the housing. And we wanted to mount these in these little fixtures. So I, I had a, a good student worker of ours from years ago and I noticed he liked the fact that we were going online. So maybe he's watching, I don't know, but his name's on, on Tranasar. He's uh, from Thailand and, um, so I don't know what time it would be in Thailand right now. Probably late at night. He's probably getting ready to go to bed. But it'd be pretty cool if he was watching because there's a funny little story about poor on. <laughs> yeah, he didn't know how to weld and I really didn't know that. And uh, so I was like, he's a student worker. And I said, you want to know what he could do? And I said, okay, I, we cut these muffler pipes down, stick them in the end of these uh, axles and weld them on there and I go and teach my class and I come out and he's sweaty and he's cussing and I'm like what what's going on and, I'm, and he's like I can't get these things to weld and you can see these welds here I'm gonna point them out not the not the prettiest things that's for sure and I'm like well let's see what you're doing and I go over there and uh, like I said you know in, in his defense he nobody ever taught him how to weld so it, and his English wasn't well enough to the point where he couldn't tell me that and I didn't know. But anyway, um, he didn't have the gas on on the MIG welder. So that's all right. I showed him how to do it and then his welds are beautiful. Then from there on out, we wanted him to do all the welding. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm doing that contact patch. And I'm, I've got my wrench on a ring gear bolt and I've got a ratchet on the pinion nut and I'm providing resistance. You want to have a little bit of force on this to make sure that you're really pushing those two gears together. If you don't, you won't really, you'll just kind of smear the paint around. There's other ways that people do this. I just find that this is easiest. 
I've seen some people wrap a shop rag around the pinion. Um, I don't know if I could spin this up, but nope, it's too tight. I'll spin it around, but I've seen them take it and wrap a shop rag around this and twist it and kind of make it real tight and then put a, uh, a wrench on a ring gear bolt. But I don't have a shop rag like that. Um, I've seen people stick pry bars in there and just kind of wedge it in the where the, the ring gear is and kind of force it with the pinion and it kind of sucks it in there and do that on both sides. I've never really done it that way either. Um, now I was not hitting all my paint, go figure. Talking about on too much there. Let me do this again. That's one disadvantage is if you, the pinion's on the other side, obviously, of the, uh, you can't really see the pinion meshing the paint too well. So if you don't get a good pattern, you might have just been completely missing, missing it. The, if you only painted four or five teeth. And this paint, you don't have to use special gear marking compound paint. You could go to a paint store or you know Hobby Lobby type stuff and just get titanium dioxide paint. But this gear marking compound paint does do a good job. In my opinion, it's a little bit better than the art stuff. All right, let's zoom in on this. The foul Blaine suggestion and not zoom in too far. I can tilt this axe a little easier. So this is the contact pattern I was getting. Look, right, okay, right there. No, nope. uh, there we go. This is the contact pattern we were getting. It is, uh, looks pretty good really, um, but it's not what I would say is perfect. If you look, I'm using a zip tie because I don't have a screwdriver handy, but if you look, it looks like there's more contact towards the top of the tooth. And some of the students were wanting some clarification on um, contact patterns. And if you look, I'm always pretty much pointing at the drive side. The drive side is really what we're concerned with. So if this pattern's off or perfect on the drive side and looks a little wonky on the coast side, well, I wouldn't want to sacrifice my drive side pattern to improve the coast. What we're looking at for a contact pattern is, and, and you guys have heard this, is like a, a broken record, half of the length of the tooth offset towards the toe. It's not running off the tooth in any direction. It's not going off towards the heel or the face. It's not being jammed in there towards the flank. And it's also, if I drew an imaginary line down the middle here, see if I can etch one in there with my, that didn't really work, but if I draw an imaginary line down the middle of the gear the tooth, that I'm spending just as much on the face of that than I am towards the flank. The flank is the, like the base or the root of the tooth, and the face is there towards the top. So, and it might be just the way this gear is kind of looking now, but it looks like, it looks pretty good, except it looks like I got a little more face contact. You might be able to see that, where it's a little shinier up at the top of the tooth than it is towards the bottom. But for the most part, that pattern, I, if we ran this, it probably would be fine. I doubt it would make a noise. Um, but the reason why I like to look at this is because, okay, we got backlash that's a little bit on the low side. And I've mentioned this to the students as well. Backlash is not a good, um, it's not a good indication. Backlash is not a good indication of too tight. No, like, no, let me rephrase that. It didn't make any sense. Okay. Contact pattern does not show tight backlash very good, very well. If I have backlash that is, say, two thousandths or three thousandths of an inch, I'm not going to see it on a contact pattern. If you remember the purpose of backlash, it's we got to have some clearance between these gears because when they're running, cruising down the road, towing something, hot day, that clearance that's maybe six thousandths of an inch, it's going to go away because some of it is because as it heats up, these parts are going to expand and it's going to take up some of that clearance. So when this thing's at 200 degrees, there's a good possibility that um, we might only have two thousandths backlash in there. There's enough room for oil to get in and lubricate it and cool the gears off, but that's about it. So if I'm looking at a pattern here and it looks good, when this thing's at 200 degrees, I don't want 
the pattern and get screwed up and get offset and you know thrown off the tooth when it's down to 2000s backlash. So really this thing is going to have a good looking pattern as far as backlash is concerned from 1000s to maybe 6 or 7000s. But now beyond that, if I take the uh, backlash and I go above the spec, the spec on this is 8000s, it's 5 to 8000s for the factory gear. If I go beyond the 5 to 8000s, I'm going to start moving that pattern towards the heel. That's one of the things on the drive side. That's one of the things that uh, it kind of doesn't even make sense. If you think of the drive pinion and the uh, ring gear, you'd think if you move the ring gear away from the drive pinion that the pattern would go off towards the face. It does a little bit, but it actually travels back down towards the heel. So the closer you get, the more you move it towards the toe, the, less back, the more backlash you've got, the more towards the heel, the less backlash, the more towards the toe. So that's something to remember. Backlash changes the pattern between the heel and the toe on the drive side. And you will see, if you Google it or you look at uh, textbooks and service manuals, you'll see tons of charts that show you contact patterns. I've only found one, and it's an old one, and I should have probably brought a copy of it, but I don't have it. <clears throat> um, GM has one that's great. It shows a perfect pattern in the middle, and then it has arrows going in all directions, and it shows you what's, what, uh, what it would look like if you have excessive backlash, what if you have tight backlash, if you have a pinion that's too far away from the ring gear center line and a pinion that's too close to the ring gear center line. You'll see all four of those, and all they do is look at the drive side. And that's the only document that I ever really agree with out there. All these other documents, they're just, they, they show, they contradict each other. Most of them do. And the other thing is, it frustrates me <clears throat> about some of the manufacturers when they make these, the service information, is they tell you what good looks like, maybe even in a picture, but then they have a little illustration of what bad looks like. So instead of doing that, why not take a good axle that looks good, make it bad. Go ahead and put too thick of a pinion shim, make the pinion close to the ringer center line. See what it does, take an actual picture of the bad pattern. And we've done that here <clears throat> in the program, so it's, it's in the PowerPoints that the students view. But yeah, on all these axles that we've gone through, we always notice on the drive side, that if your pinion is too close to the ringer center line, it drives that pattern towards the flank. If the pinion is too far away from the ringer center line, meaning too thin of a shim, it drives it towards the face. If the backlash is too tight, you usually can't see it. There's usually, if it, all there is wrong is a too tight a backlash, it still usually looks good. And if backlash is loose, it'll push off towards the heel. So that's the reason why I mentioned, if you saw it yesterday, I said, you know, our four steps, pinion, uh, depth, that's the first thing that we're going to establish. Pinion preload is the second. The third is to establish side bearing preload and backlash. And the last is to do a contact pattern. And unless you have all that other stuff set up right, including your backlash, you shouldn't be bothering painting your teeth and checking a contact pattern. All right, enough on that. I've been talking quite a bit on that. We're going to go ahead and take this axle apart. And I'm going to take my caps off. Now, one of the things that you might have remembered from yesterday, and hope if you didn't see the one yesterday, it's not annoying by me saying, if you uh, watched the stream yesterday, but it is up on YouTube and Facebook, so you can always watch it. It's two hours long, but the beauty of uh, YouTube is that you can change the speed. I don't know if you knew that. If you hit that settings, the gear on the bottom, you can change the video playback speed. The students, uh, that I have when they view these um, for my class because I have some things up there that they have to view They usually play me at 1.25 or 1.5 because apparently I talk slow and, <clears throat> and I think some of them play me at 0.75 so they can hear what it sound like if I was drunk, but uh, I Don't know if that's really what I sound like when I'm drunk anyways So I pulled these caps off like I said if you're doing this in a vehicle it is worth just threading in a couple bolts on the bottom so that way if this thing rolls out on you it'll actually catch it and we've done that and it has caught them before uh, the, the, the heads of these bolts will keep them from rolling out uh, it's like an extra set of hands now I just whipped these caps off with disregard and we shouldn't I shouldn't have done that but I know these things are marked I'm going to show you these markings they do it from the factory this one's hard to see so maybe I'll use the other one this one's not that much better, but there is an, a stamp there, and it's an H. 
and it's half of an H because the, whoever stamped it didn't get a good full stamp there. The other one also has an H stamped on it. It's up there, uh, but it's going, hor it's going sideways. It looks like an I, you know? So on one side, I have an H. That's, oh, there we go. One side, the H is going this way, and the other side, the H is going sideways. Now if I go down to my axle housing, you can see on the side of the, where the pan, pan kind of bolts up to, right there, there's an H, and it's vertical. So I know this one goes with that, because it's offset to that side, and these are both the vertical H's. On the other side, I know Blaine's going to get on me about that, I'm zooming in way too much. And then on this side, the H is horizontal, and over here the H is horizontal. Now, somebody's gone ahead and marked these anyway, because they probably didn't notice that. And I can see pin punch marks. There's one on each side. And this is the problem with the, the student units, these ones that we go through in class. We talk about making sure to mark your caps, and they didn't look to see that they were already marked from the factory, or they didn't look to see if the student marked it. So some of these axes I have have all kinds of punches and chisel marks and, and all that. I think they saw that. Oh, okay. Well, uh, let me, yeah. Thank you. Jeez, Mike, you waited forever to tell me that. That's all right. <laughs> oh, okay. So you guys just saw me with this up in the air, but nothing. That, that, that's probably going to be a good uh, blooper reel there. Okay, so I'm holding this up. And if you look, this is the H. And it's vertical. Okay, come on. Steady. There we go. That's vertical, and that H, which is stamped there, is horizontal. Sometimes they use A. Sometimes they use a... Uh, um, I can't remember. There's a V. I've seen V. They, you know, whatever the leather, letter stamps they have laying around, I guess. But yeah, you probably got my drift anyway, just even though I look like an idiot staring up at this. Um, it looked like I was probably praying to God up there because you can't see the camera I'm aiming it at, but uh, that's all right. <laughs> Praising to the rear axle gods. Um, that's, you know, so like right here, this H on this side is vertical. And the stamp on the pan rail is vertical. And the um, H on this side is horizontal. And it's horizontal the cap. So that way I know I can't get these mixed up. Always make sure, don't expect markings to be there. Always look for them. And if there are identifying marks, you're good. If there aren't, you need to make them yourself. Because these things are machined in place. So they're, they're rough casted, bolted together, then a machine machines it out. And if I take this one and put it on the other side, or if I flip this one around backwards, these, the, the circle's not going to be a true circle. It's maybe um, oval, elliptical, or offset. It's not going to be right. Okay, so now I need to get this differential case out of there. And you can see it's, it's in there tight. Uh, it, and it should be because there's preload on these bearings. So they're wedged in there. And the way I get that out easily is by using a wrench. And I mentioned this on previous, uh, the way you determine which side to put the wrench on is like right here, this axle, you can see this is a hypoid gear, so it's offset towards me. Uh, the hypoid basically means that the center line of the ring gear doesn't ever match the center line of the um, differential case or, or, or the ring gear. So the pinion gear center line and the ring gear center line don't match. And in this case, it's offset um, towards me. If this was flipped, I'd have to do it on the other side. It's just and then in a vehicle, we usually think of the pinions as below the center line, but sometimes they'll flip them, and there'll be a center, a, uh, um, a high pinion axle, especially on the front. Front wheel drive vehicle, or the axles that they take, uh, a, like a typical rear axle, and they make it a front axle, um, they put a reverse cut gear in it, and they just flip it over. So you can take a normal rear axle that's a low pinion, and swing it around to the front, flip it upside down, and then they put a reverse cut gear in so that the drive, the, the, what was the coast, now becomes the drive, and then now you've made a front axle out of a rear axle. So anyway, that, that's kind of beside the point. Um, I'm going to put a wrench. I'm going to put it towards the top of the axle housing. I'm going to spin this, and then I'm going to rotate this. I might be able to do it by hand. If I need to, I could put a ratchet on it, but Okay, so I was able to spin that, and it kind of rolled that differential case out of there. 
Now I want to be careful so I don't lose any fingers. I'm going to lift this diff case up, put my pinkies on the bearings so they don't fall off. Not, not my pinkies, but so the bearings don't fall off. The pinkies are on there. The doctors attached them well last time I chopped them off. So now I've got the uh, differential case out and I've got my pinion in there. I'll go ahead and take the pinion out. One of the things I didn't do on either the GM one or this one is I didn't measure the preloads. And that would probably be a good idea when you're taking it apart, especially um, if you if you just if you're taking apart something somebody else did and you want to make sure that they did it right, you should check preloads. I'll go ahead and check this pinion preload by itself. But like I said, I probably should have checked everything before I completely took it apart because then I could have find, found out if the side bearings were preloaded properly. But the way we check preload is I use an inch pound torque wrench. And th this is a dial type. It's really nice. It's old. It's been here for many years. Probably, I know more years than I've been here. Um, but they, they're good. And um, you could use the beam type. It's a little harder to read the numbers. This one, the numbers are laid out easily. I don't want to measure the amount of torque it takes to initially break it away, because in that case, this was 40 inch pounds. I want to measure the amount of torque it takes to continue to rotate it. And it's floating around 10. There's a couple bad spots in there. I can feel it makes the dial jump up, but it's really averaging around 10. So these are all disassembly kind of steps here, just to kind of get an idea of how the axle was set up. Now I'm going to go ahead and pull the pinion nut off. Uh, now, I will also warn you guys that these axles have been apart probably 50 times. So things come apart easier on an axle that's been disassembled a zillion times. This tool that I just put on is a yoke holder. And it's just basically a fancy tool that I can put these little pins where the U-joint uh, bolts would go through, the straps or the U-bolts. Um, <clears throat> you know, you have to have some way of holding this pinion while you're loosening that nut. Do you need this tool? I don't know. This one actually has also kind of a, an opening on the end that if, if you can't use these little studs, you can maybe fit that around it. We've had to do that with some axles, and this is not the desirable way to do it because they fly off there a lot of times. It's usually a lot of torque on pinion nuts. Now, as we'll see here in a second, that these, these pinions are a little different. They, this is an older Dana, and on the older Danas, they use shims to establish preload. They don't use a collapsible spacer. Now, in around 2002-ish, <coughs> uh, Dodge started putting the collapsible spacers, and, and I think most of the Danas after in the mid-2000s had collapsible spacers. Really, collapsible spacers for preload uh, makes sense for a manufacturing standpoint. I, I don't obviously work in a manufacturing facility, but I can envision when they're assembling this at a factory, they put the pinion in, they put a yoke in with a collapsible spacer. They can tighten it down and have a robot spin it. If it's not there, tighten it down a little bit more, spin it, tighten it down a little bit more and spin it. Whereas if you have shims, if you put it together and it's not right, you gotta take it back apart and change the shims. So from a manufacturing standpoint, collapsible spacer kind of makes sense. From a over, you notice that, how easy that was to take off? They're usually not that, they're usually about 200 foot pounds or so. Um, <clears throat> but, oh, do you have a question there, Mike? When you were talking about the front and the rear axles, do the uh, front and rear axles have to have the same ratio? Yes, they do. Sometimes the, uh, you have different manufacturers front and rear and the gear tooth counts don't work out perfectly. So like this might be a 410, this is a 410 to one front axle on these. And you might have a 411, 4.11. And the, a, a hundredth of a, of a um, decimal is not gonna make a difference. I don't know really how far off you could be, but it's gotta be pretty much the same ratio. The thing is, is most manufacturers, cause you're, you're kind of limited with the amount of pinion teeth you can have and the a number of ring gear teeth you can have. So the combinations are usually the same whether you've got a GM or a Dana or uh, you know, like a corporate axle from Chrysler. So the ratios are going to be, usually it's like 307, 342, uh, 373, 410, 456. So 
Yeah, you can't put a 373 and a 410 together because you just can't operate in two ratios at once. If you did, if you accidentally did that, maybe bought a junkyard axle, put it in, and it was the wrong ratio, uh, if you put it in four-wheel drive, it would just burp, it'd stop like you have a parking brake applied. Um, so, yeah, that, now, that was a good question, though, because it is important to make sure your ratios are the same. Now, I am going to pull this off, and if this comes off easy, it's just because it's been off a million times, usually these companion flanges will not just pull off. There will be thread sealer, not thread, I guess it's a, I guess it could be sealer, it's thread sealer or pipe sealant that they put between the splines of the pinion and the splines of the yoke so that you don't leak oil through there, and it kind of works like a glue. So nine, 99 times out of 100, matter of fact, if it pulled out by hand on a live job, I'd be curious about it. But usually, you'll have to pound this out or put a puller on it and pull this flange out. Let's just see if it comes out by hand. Yep, so matter of fact, this never happens either, where I can just drop the pinion out. Uh, Mr. Beerman here is probably happy to see that because he knows it didn't go crashing to the floor and ship the nice paint job we have out here. But two areas that, that were odd there is one, that this pinion bearing just was not tight. It was able to come off. This is always an interference fit, not by much. It's, it's usually just by a little bit. And I'll go ahead and switch so I can talk to you guys. Um, it's a small little screen I'm clicking on there, but so usually this is a, a interference fit and it doesn't take a lot of force, but I'll have to put a pipe or something over it and tap onto it to get it to, to, to fit on there properly. And like I said, this is the area where there's usually some sealant. So when that goes on and it's set up, it acts kind of like a glue and it does not want to come off. Okay, so oh, now, oh, of course I got stuck on there. But, <clears throat> this is our pinion that we've got on our, our Dana, this um, kind of early model that uses shims. And uh, <clears throat> these are the pinion preload spacers or shims. This is where a collapsible spacer would have been if we used a collapsible spacer. And like if you got a newer Dana, the, the collapsible spacer would live in this area. And then <clears throat> as you tighten this pinion nut down, what you'd be doing if there's a collapsible spacer in there is you'd be crushing that sleeve the more you tighten it. And it brings these bearings closer to each other. And the races are pounded into the housing so they can't go anywhere. So as I bring these bearings closer by tightening that pinion nut, I'm going to increase the preload. Now this is a little different because we have the Dana. So we just put a shim stack in there and when we tighten it down, it's, it is what it is. You, you could tighten that nut down to 50 foot pounds and it's going to give you a certain amount of preload. If I tighten it to it, 250 foot pounds, it's not going to get any closer. So at, uh, with the Dana, which is different than the GM, I need to uh, adjust my preload by pulling this back out, swapping shims around, going back together with it. That's why it's always good to keep your stuff together and in order to give you an idea of where to start. Um, now, if you were to buy a new pinion, and you had no idea where to start from because maybe this ledge isn't machined in the exact same spot. What I do is I put more shims than I need on there. Like I'd put, maybe put all of them in, I don't know. Put a lot of shims in there. So that way when you put this in the axle housing, it's gonna be sloppy loose. Just tighten it down, uh, just to draw all these parts together. Then I'd put a dial indicator on it, measure how much movement there is. If it's clunk, 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 if it's got 50 thousandths of movement, then I know I need to go in there and take probably 55 thousandths of shim out. If I took 50 out, it would just bring it all together and it would all touch, but I wouldn't have preload. Take another five out and that'd give me preload. So uh, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. I'll, um, we'll, we'll maybe look into that. If it, if it doesn't make sense, I'll, I'll cover it some more when we go back together with it. So this housing, uh, at this point, we think we're pretty much together and we're, um, we're disassembled, but one of the things that Dana does is they don't put their shim in between the head of the pinion and the bearing, inner bearing race. If you look in there, there's no room for it really. So where do they put it? It's actually between the outer bearing race and the housing. So I'll flip this over just to show you real quick. I have to get, it almost fell out anyway. These axle housings are worn out. 
Normally these do not come out. I mean, they're not hard. It, it, you need a brass drift to pound them out, but they're usually not falling out on their own. But this is the rear outer race. The shims live between the, uh, the, the housing, axle housing, and then the outer race. I'm gonna real quick grab this uh, camera and I'm gonna show you guys a cutaway of um, a Dana axle. So right here, you saw the GM one yesterday if you tuned in, but this is the Dana 44. It's the same axle we're going through. It's just cut away, looks a little different. Uh, normally this would all be metal, right? So right here are those pinion depth shims. And you can see the preload shims are right there. So we got preload shims and depth shims. Those are the same preload shims that from um, the, what I was just showing you a second ago. And uh, so if we look, if we take the, the relationship between these shims, sorry if this is bouncing around, I'm holding a tripod. When I pound this out of race out, I'll have the stack of shims. I bent these over on purpose just so you can see that those shims are there. And we're gonna use special tools to figure out what uh, a good starting point is with these shims. Now, if you were to rebuild one of these on an axle that's working fine, let's say you've got a, a Jeep and you're overhauling it and you're putting different uh, gear set in there, a lower gear set, putting a locker in it or something like that. When you take it apart, the shims that you have here, like let's say if this all adds up to 40 thousandths of an inch, when I'm done, I'd put those 40 thousandths of an inch back in the housing with my new pinion. Because these shims take into consideration the differences in housings not really the differences in the pinion. Now there's going to be a little bit of a, a, a I got to kind of retract that a little bit on these Danas because these Danas do etch on the head of the pinion a variance number, meaning if they didn't make this pinion perfect, they'll tell you how to adjust that shim. And I've got a little chart that I'll show you here in a second. But when we use the tools and we actually have these tools inside this housing, it's going to tell us what shim that we use for this axle housing. And it's called the nominal shim. So a nominal shim is basically saying that this is a shim that will work in this housing if I had a perfect pinion. If I don't have a perfect pinion, I'm going to have to adjust the nominal shim a little bit. And it's usually plus or minus three thousandths. It's not much. But um, we'll see what, how that goes here in a second. So that is that cutaway. And if you notice, this has got the seal in there. They have an oil slinger that lives in there that kind of keeps oil from bombarding that seal. And um, anyway, that's a little cutaway. Hopefully that understands. Now, if you look over here too, I've got a cookie oven going. And um, I'm making some cookies for later. Actually, I'm not doing that. But uh, I'm gonna use that because people were asking about the ring gear yesterday. I've got that heated up to about 200 degrees and at some point I will demonstrate. We'll pop this uh, ring gear off and show you how to put that on. It won't be tough. All right, so, all right, so hopefully you understand how these pinion shims are laid out. I'm going to go ahead and pop this race out. It'll probably just fall out of my hands because, like I said, these things are worn out. Normally, it, they come out with a little more force than that. <laughs> this just fell right out into my hand. These are my pinion depth shims. So, they, they, they're not all the same thickness. I'll go ahead and measure these real quick. They come in a, a few different thicknesses. They come in three thousandths, five thousandths, um, ten thousandths, and thirty thousandths. So, like this one here, this is a ten. Another. Another 10. I usually don't like measuring these with the dial calipers, but they, that's what we're using. This is a 3. The three's up there. The 3's and 5's, I think that's a 5. They're hard to tell the difference. So you can sometimes feel, like I can feel the difference between the 10 and everything else. But, and then this one's a 5. And this is a 10. So I've got three 10s, so 30, 40, 
I got 43 thousandths of shim. Oh gosh. Yeah, I knew that was going to happen. I got 43 thousandths of shim in this housing. So it's good to know that because if I, like I said, if I were going to go through and overhaul this axle, I would reference this shim stack. Like if I were to put new ring and pinion in there, I'd reference this shim, shim stack. I can't say that. Um, I am going, you might have to take my word for this. I'll try to show this to you. Maybe I can get to reflect in the light. There is right up here, let me make sure I'm pointing the right spot. There is a plus two marked on this. I'll roll that around. Maybe some of you guys can just barely catch that. It's, it's so faint. Somebody went in when they manufactured this gear and they etched in plus two. That means when they built this pinion, they made this 2000s too big. They put it in some kind of device that can measure it and say, whoop, it's over 2000s. They're not gonna scrap the gear because of that. They're just gonna go ahead and tell the builder that this is 2000s too big. So whatever I measure in here, I'm gonna subtract 2000s. So what did I say, this is 43? If this is 43, that means they measured 45, and then they made the shim stack 43 to account for the pinion that is uh, 2000s too big. So really, I have to kind of know that. Um, this is the reason why. I want to reuse, if this, is, if this axle housing here is perfectly fine, I'm just doing a gear change or changing a, you know, some, some parts. I, you know, I, I trust the way it's set up, so I don't want to go through and just scrap everything and, uh, and start from scratch. I want to take that uh, into account. So I'm going to show you guys here this little picture of the slideshow here. This is from, oh, okay. I forgot to set this thing on a, uh, it's going to scroll through it. There's a shim kit, by the way. This is all from Randy's Worldwide, 35 bucks. That's the price of a gear set for this, it's $301. That's from Yukon, and Randy's didn't have the Dana listed, but you can buy Dana. That right there is the chart. And let me see if I could zoom in on that. I forgot to set that thing up to, uh, to basically not scroll. <laughs> so um, it's on an image slideshow, but it's, uh, I didn't have it set up completely. But I do have the instructions over here, service manual page, and that chart is, of course, laid out in the instructions. So. I go to the boom, I'll show you what I'm looking at here. So here's this little chart. If I was going off of a brand new housing that I use special tools, I would just, let me just go ahead and say this first. If I was, if this is a brand new housing, I used the special tools to figure out my pinion depth shims, and it said uh, I needed 40 thousandths, and then and this is the pinion I'm putting in there, and it says it's plus two, I'd put a 38 thousandths in because this one's uh, two thousandths too big. But if I'm taking this housing that's already got a plus two, and if you look, it says original gear variance plus two, and now my replacement pinions got a minus three, I need to take whatever shims I have in there and I need to add five thousandths to it. That's what this is showing. So this little chart just kind of does the math. There's no reason why you couldn't figure this out in your head, but it's one of those things that kind of keeps it simple. Zero is a perfect pinion. One, two, three, four is a pinion that's made one, two, three, four thousandths too big. Negative one, two, three, four is a pinion that's made one, two, three, four thousandths too small. And then this is the replacement pinion etching. So if I'm, if I'm taking out a minus two and I'm putting in a minus two, I don't have to do anything to the shims that I pulled out. They're already, you're replacing the same um, variance with the, or two pinions with the same variance. So hopefully this chart makes a little bit of sense. If not, I can, I can post up and I can try to elaborate a little bit more on that. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through measure pinion depth. We got this thing completely taken apart. and We're going to start going through the procedures to put it back together. So this is what we like to do. We want to put, I'm going to clean this out because we don't want any, any kind of uh, debris in there to screw up our, our readings. I'm going to put this pinion bearing race in there. I'm going to put it in there without any shims. And the reason why I do this is because when I have my dial indicator on there, I am going to measure exactly what the nominal um, shim thickness should be. Notice how the sound changed? Kind of went high pitched and low pitched. That shows where 
that shows where it bottomed out. So now this toolkit, this, uh, okay, this toolkit right here, I'm going to use these pieces and this Dana toolkit that I've got. Let me, uh, oh, it's heavy. This is the Dana toolkit complete. I got this dial indicator and it's mounted in this thing called a scooter block. Good, I'm glad. I forgot to check the dial and sometimes these things are broken. This part right here mimics the ring gear center line. So I use this in conjunction with, okay, I need an extra hand here. Um, I'm good, Mike. I was just saying that out loud. But I'll use this to go across the, the ring gear uh, where the ring gear would sit. And this is going to mimic a perfect ring gear center line. Then I'm going to put this along with some of these parts and pieces. This is for the Dana 44. It says right there, Dana 44. This is the Dana 60. Oh, no, that's the Dana 70. Dana 35C. Dana 30. I guess um, the 60 would be one of these, but it's, they're not in here. Okay, so I'm going to put this. Basically what this does is it takes my bearing. I'm going to put that in upside down. It's going to center this perfect drive pin. This tool mimics a perfect drive pinion. Uh, it's basically going to say that everything is so manufactured at such high tolerance here that this is the same as a pinion with a variance mark zero. It's kind of hard to believe that when you stack all these parts together. So you do have to use a bearing, and I keep a bearing in these kits because I don't want students pressing on and off this bearing because there's really no room to get in there to get that bearing out, and it will uh, they'll destroy it. So I just have in all of our little kits, I have a bearing sitting there so you can use it. Because the only reason why you would have to press that bearing off the pinion is to get to this, to do this to, uh, measurement. It's not like you have to do it to get to shims. All right, so on the other side, I'll thread this on with the front pinion bearing and tighten it all up. And we'll do that here. Now that once I move this kit out of the way, once again, this tool set here is mimicking a perfect drive pinion. So it sits in there. I grab my front bearing and this tool, I'm going to go in from underneath and tighten it down. Threaded rod is long because it's designed to work on axles as high as the Dana 80. And uh, those are huge. Those are going like buses. That's one nice thing about this toolkit. I think the toolkit's $1,200, but if you build axles a lot, it might be worth it. And, and like I said, if you're doing this in your Jeep in your backyard, you don't need the tool because you're just changing gears or, or some kind of a, um, you're just doing some modification. You, you kind of reference that original shim that you pull out. But being a school, we want to go through and make sure you guys know. Now the dealers, if you work at a Chrysler dealer or a Ram dealer, you will have these tools. So sometimes these guys have to go through, they'll get a, a vehicle in for warranty and it makes noise. They take it apart and they don't trust the way it's set up. So they'll have to use these tools to go find a good starting point for shims. So that way they're not guessing. They just don't pay enough time to overhaul an axle to really take it apart more than once. And um, you want to put your caps on. This is just really, if I, I could probably do this without putting the caps on, but this is going to make sure that this center line is seated. If I don't um, put the caps on, there could be a little piece of dust or uh, debris that's underneath these that lifts it up a few thousands and a few thousands is enough to make a difference. These rear axles, they, it's kind of crude technology, it's been around forever, but these ring and pinions, um, they have precise contact patches. They, if the pinion gears off plus or minus from where it should be, probably more than two or three thousandths, the pattern will be off and you stand a chance of having noise. And it's not going to wear it properly either. So I just snug that up. Okay, so now here's the thing. On this axle, this thing that's mimicking a perfect drive pinion, right? 
This is mimicking a perfect ring gear center line. So the height difference between these two pieces is going to be my nominal shim thickness. That's where this tool comes into place. It's a scooter block and it's got a dial indicator on it. So I'll zero the dial indicator on this piece here and then when I drag it over, whatever I read on my dial is my shim thickness. If you saw the, the deal that I did um, yesterday with GM, this is a lot simpler. This is a lot, uh, more, a lot straightforward. A lot more straightforward. Okay, I know you can't see the zero, but I am zeroed out right now. And um, matter of fact, why don't we do this, Mike? I'll switch it over to the tripod. And if you want, you can just pick that up and aim it at this. Don't trip over the million wires we have. You can't get too close with that lens or else it'll get blurry. You'll probably have to be like that far back. Hi. Okay. So I am, I've got it pretty close to zero. And then I usually don't let this dial just slam off of there. So I'll hold it up a little bit and I'll carry it over to the, to the arbor. And then if you, uh, we got to kind of go, we, we move it towards the arbor and it'll climb up and then it'll start going back down. Then go back, it'll climb up, and then start going back down as I go back and forth. I want to read the point where the needle climbs the highest. See, that's probably about there. What am I reading? 45? About 44, 45 thousandths, right? That's what was, I mean, I, they had it set up. Whoever built this last had the right pinion shim in there because it's showing... I'm seeing about 45 thousandths, and if you remember, I pulled 43 thousandths shim out, and then the variance that I have on this pinion head was a minus two, no, wait, plus two, which means they made this two thousandths too big, so I need to take the 45, take two away from it, and then voila, they had 43 in there. Oh, okay, so that wasn't set up too bad. Thank you, Mike. So hopefully that makes sense. If you have questions on how this pinion depth setup is, you know, the tools, Make sure you post a comment up there because I'll be moving past that here uh, in a second. You can probably put the tripod back. Good camera operation there, buddy. He's camera shy. He's one of those silent types. He doesn't want to talk. Behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, yeah. You can see the little mic boom hit me in the head or something like that, but... Okay, so I'm taking this back out. I've, I've noted that the nominal shim thickness is 45 thousandths of an inch. So, um, I will take that into consideration. Now, I'm gonna do something, because the pattern that we saw when we took it apart, it wasn't that bad, right? If you remember, I was saying it's a little offset towards the face, but it'd probably run quiet. And that kind of goes to show you that they, they recommended it at 45,000 shim, and with the pinion that had a plus two on it, we put a 43 in there. Whoever put this together last followed the instructions and put a 43 in there, and that probably would have worked perfectly fine. So instead of putting it back together exactly the way we took it apart, because what's the fun in that? I like to do this. We're going to go ahead and screw it up. We saw what good is. So let's look what bad is. So we can kind of um, force this thing into a position where the patterns shouldn't be good and we can predict what's going to happen. So I'm going to take the pinion shims and I think I'll take, I might take 10 thousandths out of it. Is our battery doing all right, Mike? Okay. So that way, our, instead of having 43 thousandths shim in there, we're going to put 33,000 shim in there. We'll screw it up on purpose. And what we should be able to predict what's going to happen to that pattern. As I was saying earlier, the pattern has a tendency with the pinion of moving between the face and the flank. The further away the pinion is from the ring gear center line, the more the pattern travels towards the face. So if I take an extra 10,000 of shim out, I should see a lot of face contact. It's easier to take shims out than add shims, mainly because I'm a low on shim count here. 
and I could just take one of these out. Now, here's a relationship that I know the students that already went through the Dana uh, lecture in class, they had some confusion on. I have this little thing on these lectures where they go through and they mark, a, they go through the worksheet and then they try to answer these questions. If they don't understand it, they put an X in the confusion box and then we try to cover it later or I try to answer their questions. Um, all along I've been saying that preload and position are not really related. And for the most part they aren't. But sometimes, kind of like with the side bearings, if you change the shims, you, you use the shims to establish preload and position. So the over, like on the side bearings, the overall shim thickness between both sides, if you add them together, that's going to uh, establish your preload. But the combination of shims from side to side is going to establish where that gear's at. That similar thing happens here on this Dana. If I change, and let me go ahead and pound this race out so I can maybe demonstrate it better. I wasn't going to paint it on the board, but my art skills aren't that great. And I don't think it would um, turn out okay. I guess that's one nice thing about having these things worn out like they are, is they sure come apart easy. Okay, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to slide this stuff over. I'm going to try to get this image on the table. Boom. Okay, so here's my opinion. And I went ahead and laid this um, bearing in there the outer race, and then this is the, these are the shims. So imagine this assembly kind of built up, put together. We've got the, the bearing here, and we got the shims. If I take any of these shims out, what's going to happen to the pinion? It's going to move that direction. Now, I'll exaggerate it. Obviously, I have to take 10,000s of shim out, it's not going to move that far, but it's going to move everything 10,000s that way. So if I take 10,000s out from here, I just move that bearing, this front bearing 10,000s away as well. So what do I need to do? I need to make sure I have 10,000s less preload bearing. Normally this wouldn't be an issue because the very first thing I set up in an axle using my special tools or just by transferring shims is my pinion depth, right? So once I put these proper amount of shims in the housing and I pound them in, then the next thing I set up is my pinion preload. So when I put these in there and I tighten them up and I get the preload that I want, it's good. And I usually don't have to go back and adjust it. But let's say I did all that. I put it all back together and I did a contact pattern and it said my pinion depth was off a little bit. So I had to take it all back apart and I had to add five thousandths or three thousandths or take away five or three thousandths. If I just go, if I just change the five thousand shim out, and put it back together without tweaking these shims, I'm going to screw up my preload. Mainly because whatever I do to these is going to move my pinion. And if I'm moving my pinion, I'm moving this uh, bearing um, in the front. So it's not a problem when you first set it up because of the sequence and the steps. Because of the sequ sequence that we have, the very first thing we do is pinion depth. And when we go back together, we got the depth all, the way it's like, uh, supposed to be. Then we go with our preload, and it's in there, you know, with the right around of preload. We put our side bearings in and get the backlash and all that stuff. Everything's good. Um, and then when I'm done, I do a contact pattern. Where the confusion comes in is if I have to go in and tweak my pinion depth shim because it's off a little bit according to the contact pattern. Whatever I do to my pinion shim, I have to do to my, um, my preload shim. So if I took 10 out here, I need to take 10 out there. Because if I take 10 out here, I moved it this way, I need to take 10 out there to move this bearing back to where it's supposed to be. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, let me show you another thing while we're on this, this topic of preload and all that stuff. Mike, why don't you follow me over here to this vise? Because I'm going to try to, this is, somebody said they're still struggling with the, um, the concept of, of preload and position. And... Smell that? Cookies are almost done. No. But uh, this is a, so I was thinking of what's a good way to describe preload? Like right now, 
this, let me use this two by four in this vise to kind of explain it. If I take this vise and I just barely tighten it up. So right now, I don't have really much clamp on that, but it's, it's stationary, it's being held. It's not moving anywhere side to side, right? But look what I can do. I can deflect it. I kind of loosen it up somewhere. It's still in position, but it's not stable. Now if I add preload, just like on the axle, I'm putting more shims in, I'm squeezing this, these parts. Now it's rigid, it's stiff. So what I've done is I've, this, them, this kind of simulates preload in a sense. Just bringing these parts together so they don't physically have looseness isn't good enough because these will be sloppy. You need to squeeze these parts together. That's why we put a little more shim in, either on the pinion or on the side bearings, to get a good grab and, and squeeze on this housing because it makes everything stiffer. Now the same thing would hold true with putting too much shim in. I don't want to, you know, you hear it crunching when I do that because, yeah, it's not moving anywhere, but I've, I've destroyed the, the part. Now I've got, you know, crunch marks in my, in my 2x4 and I can't use it anymore. So, yeah, too many shims are bad because it damages the part too loose or uh, not enough shims in there. It doesn't allow the stability, as you can see, like this board would not be held stable uh, unless I had enough squeeze on it. So that was maybe an analogy that you might be able to figure out. But Okay, so we'll go back to this. I'm going to go ahead and put, like I said, I'm going to put 10,000 slush shim in here. And I don't know if, I don't think I took it out yet. So here's my dial indicator, uh, dial caliper. This is the three, or the five, the three. So I'll keep those two. You know what? I'm feeling crazy. I might put, I'm going to put more shim because. I'm just crazy like that. This is, we'll do five thousandths more shim. That's not much. So that's kind of more realistic, which means I will have to add five thousandths more pinion um, preload. So don't forget, because I'll probably forget. So don't forget that I actually added five thousandths to what we had. Oh, and I'm not centered. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. We're, uh, Mr. Beerman here is monitoring the uh, Facebook and the YouTube, and um, now I'm uh, trying to run the producer side, and there we go, makes a sound. Now look, this is also another thing, I'm going to deviate from the service manual a little bit. If you have a service manual and you're reading a lot of this, they actually, before they have you put the pinion in, um, you know, they do the measurement, they actually have you put the pinion in and tighten it down. And then they want you to use this special tool at some point later on, way later on, they actually have you put a special tool in there to measure, I, I missed it, but it's in here somewhere. But it's later on in the process, they have you uh, use a special tool to measure the amount of side clearance, side movement back to back. It's off the ring gear backlash adjustment. I don't do that now at this point because if I put my, diff my pinion in there, I won't be able to do this measurement because the pinion will be in the way. So I'm going to show you guys this, this process here. It's using the Dana dummy bearings. And, uh, oop, I just dropped the shim. I'm going to switch over to the tripod here real quick. This is the diff case. And Dana which I wish they didn't do, but they put their shims between the differential case. I got a lot of metal down here, don't I? Between the differential case. They put their shims for the side bearings between the differential case and the side bearing itself. Now look at that. This thing slides on and off like this. Super easy. This isn't because these are worn out. I'm the one that made this happen. Um, and I'll tell you why I did this. We used to have to press these on and off every time they tweak a shim, and the students were destroying these bearings. So I chucked these, this, uh, in my infinite wisdom, I chucked these differential cases up on the lathe, and I shaved a few thousandths of an inch off of this surface right here, so these bearings slide on and off. Normally, you would have to get a two-jaw puller and pull these off. 
Uh, the very first time you take it off, you might have to destroy it to get it off because um, there's no spot. Like if you saw yesterday with the GM, they put these little dimples in here so you can get a two-jaw puller in there and pull, get underneath the race and pull it out. Um, they don't give you those on these Danas. So you might destroy these bearings the first time you take them apart. You get under the cage, you stretch the cage out, all the rollers fall out. Um, if you still can't get it off, I've seen people use a, a grinder with a, a cutoff wheel on there and then kind of put, grind through it basically halfway and then chisel it and break it off. I have seen people, which I don't recommend, take an air hammer with a chisel bit and go underneath between the diff case and the bearing. The reason why is because you will be shooting shards of metal off if you do that, and it's kind of dangerous. Um, but, you know, we, some of us like to live dangerously. So I went ahead and machined these things down. Um, well, if you take these apart, I do recommend taking a die grinder or some kind of a grinder and making two notches so that if, when you have to take these back off, if you do, hopefully you won't, but if you have to take these back off, you can get a two-jaw puller underneath it. All right, now we use... Uh, to figure out the, 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 the shim thicknesses that we need, we actually use what we call a dummy bearing set. And I'm going to pull these bearings off. Like I said, I, some, sometimes I need to get a screwdriver and get a little tap to get them off. Uh, okay. the screwdriver over here. Give her a little tap. Normally, like I said, they don't come off this easy. They'll require a puller, but the only reason why I kind of teased myself and said, in my infinite wisdom, is because the dummy bearings that we use with this, they're designed to, they're, they mimic a perfect bearing set. So if I took the, basically a bearing right here, a side bearing, and I compare it to this dummy bearing, they're the exact same. If I measure the thickness here, I got, you know, it's hard to do it with this, but I'm going to say one inch, one inch, seven, I don't know, one inch 70 something, about one inch 70 thousandths. If you look over here, one inch, it's a little less, but it's probably because I'm the way I'm holding this, but um, these are the same. I'll just take my word for it. These are the same thicknesses, uh, basically this dimension here. Now, the dummy bearings go ahead and they open up this inner spot. So say if this is an inch and a half, this is an inch and a half plus 5,000. So basically you won't have to press this on the differential case. It'll just slide on. Whereas this one, a normal bearing, you'd have to slide, uh, slide it on or press it on. The reason why I say, in my infinite wisdom, I went ahead and machined that down is because by the time you're done with five thousandths off of this, and this being five thousandths larger inside diameter, they're a little sloppier than they probably should be to give you a perfect reading. But it'll work. So if you take a look, you put your dummy bearings on here, and you put this in there. Going back to what I said before, the service manual has you do this later on. But the reason why the service manual has you do this later on is they have you do it without the ring gear installed. And I leave the ring gear on there because in these um, classroom units, I don't want the ring gear bolts taken off and all that stuff too much. Um, so we have to do this measurement with the pinion out so that we have enough room. What this measurement does, when I have these dummy bearings in, if you remember, because these shims are located between the differential case and the bearing, and you have to press them on and off to get to them, we use these dummy bearings to kind of pretend like they're the real bearings, and we do our measurements using the dummy bearings, and then we um, do the math, and we figure out the shims that we use, go back together with them with the real bearings, and hope that we're close. So the first step that we're going to do here is determine how much total movement we have. And we're going to kind of have to write that number down so we don't forget it, because we'll use it later. Use my dial indicator. One of the tricky parts on this process is trying to find a smooth spot to measure this off of. I usually go off of a ring gear bolt, but you got to hold everything kind of steady because the ring gear bolt has um, riding on it, or you know the, the little uh, 
raised. It's a grade 8 bolt, so it has all the little dimples and so forth. So when I do this, I'm going to try to get the movement, figure out what my total movement is. And it can get tricky because I'm trying to Seventy to forty-seven, maybe. So thirty plus forty-seven is seventy-seven. See how quick I did that math in my head? So I, when I said thirty, it's because I'm I'm negative. I went back thirty thousands, thirty-two thousands, and then I passed the zero point. Come on, and I passed the zero point, and then I went to forty-three. So 43 and, and um, 32 would be 45, uh, 75. There's, so I'm going to say 76 because it looks like it's probably close to 76 thousandths. That's the total movement I have in this differential case. So I'm going to go ahead and take a marker, figure out what I do. What do I do with my, there they are. I got it, Mike, it's right there. I'm going to go ahead and write down total movement. 77 thousandths, right? So that way I won't forget, it was 76. I agreed with 76. That's the total amount of movement. Right there, I mean, that tells me something, doesn't it? Because if I take 76 thousandths of shims and put it in there, I'd have a differential case that wouldn't have any backlash or any preload. It'd just take up the space. Now, if I added preload to that, I would add 8 thousandths on top of that number. So I'd have an total thickness of basically 84 thousandths. And then, yeah, I wouldn't be able to know what I need for backlash, but I'd be able to wedge that gear in there and I should have some preload. So now, later on, when I go back with these dummy bearings, I'm gonna be trying to figure out what combination of that 84 thousandths I'm gonna need side to side to get my backlash going. Mike, did you need anything or you just, okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and put these dummy bearings off to the side. In this differential case, I got my markings wrote down there. I got my pinion bearing, uh, my, my outer race is already installed. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and install. Now I went ahead, what did I say? I added 5,000 to shim. Because I knew my pinion preload was pretty good when I took it apart, I measured it at 10. I'm gonna go ahead and put a 5,000 shim with this pinion, because that'll get me close. Because if you remember, I had to add 5,000 to my, uh, I didn't have to, but I decided to add 5,000 so we could see what it does to the pattern. If I add 5,000 to my pinion depth, that would have brought that whole, uh, the whole pinion assembly with that front bearing would have gone forward or, or actually towards the rear of the vehicle. That would have carried the bearing with it, would have squeezed down to the race too hard, so I put this extra 5,000 shim in there to um, prevent that from happening. Okay, so I'm, I got that ready to go. Flip this axle housing around. I'm about ready to complete step number two on the overhaul part, which is put the, uh, we got pinion depth figured, and now we're gonna go ahead and tighten this down for pinion preload. All right, so I got my shims in there. Normally, I would have a seal in here and I'd, uh, I'd put the bearing on and then I'd put the seal on and all that kind of stuff too but I don't do that on these lab units so we don't have to buy a seal every time and like I said usually these don't slap together this easy the preload was maybe a little low because if you remember when I measured it when I started it was at 10 inch pounds I believe the spec on the Danas for the used bearings are 10 to uh, 20 and new bearings are 20 to 40 something along those if depending on the year you're looking at sometimes those numbers change around quite a bit so um, I've seen them like in the little paperwork that I've got here that I just showed you earlier I think it says 10 to 15 and then 15 to 25 
And then online, if you look at this uh, from Chrysler, they have a completely different set of numbers, even, if, even though it's the same axle. So I, I don't know. Um, in a general rule, you usually see used bearings at around 10 to 15 inch pounds and new bearings around 20 to 25. I think if you did that, you couldn't go wrong. So normally this pinion nut, see that, that, uh, that might be all right. Felt kind of tight first, but normally the um, pinion nut would get torqued to 200 to 220 foot pounds. Rotate, this feels tight, but it's always hard to tell until you get a dial, uh, uh, your torque wrench on there and until you uh, look at it while it's spinning. It's not the breakaway torque, it's not a torque it takes to keep it spinning. The reason why we need to know this number, for one, it is a little high. It's, uh, it's sitting at 30. But we can pretend this is a new bearing. So that way I don't have to take it back apart. So we're going to say that our pinion preload is, uh, and you guys probably, unless you got super fast eyeballs, you probably couldn't see that while I was spinning it. But you have to trust me when I say that. Our, I'm going to write it down. PP, pinion preload, is 30 inch pounds. That way I can remember it. Now I have my pinion installed, and I think it's at the right depth. Now I'm ready to go and do the second measurement that I was doing on my um, differential case. So I'll, with the dummy bearings back on my diff case, I'm going to put my differential case back in there. You know, you can make dummy bearings yourself off of old bearings. If you take your bearings, because you know, these, if you don't destroy them, I mean, even if you destroyed them, all you, well, you, yeah, you pretty much have to have them somewhat intact. But you can epoxy these together. I'd probably go in there and rough this up with like a, some kind of a sanding grinder, something, so that way the epoxy will stick to it. Do that on the races and glue it together. You could solder it if you got a torch or braze it. But you know, measure this thickness overall and, comp and basically try to keep that dimension. And if it stays that, then you can hone the inside of these out. Like just use a Dremel, um, a die grinder with a flat flap wheel or a grinding wheel, you know, a round grinding wheel and grind this open so it just slides over. You can make your own uh, dummy bearings. You don't have to, have to go out and buy these things. So you're like, well, okay, what am I doing that's different here? This is the same thing you did earlier. It is, it's the same movement, but the pinion's in there now. And at the pinion in there, this thing's not gonna have as much side-to-side -side movement. So if I go in there, remember my total movement before was 76 thousandths. Now if I go through and do this measurement, let's see what I end up getting. Find a smooth spot on that ring gear bolt. I'm going from negative 30 to 18. So I've got 48 thousandths. And because the pinion is on this side, I'm getting 48 thousandths of movement on my ring gear side. I wish it was a nice even number, so that way the math would be easier, but I can write this stuff down. Negative 32. 15 or 16, what was that, 40? I said 48, we'll do that. So I'm gonna write down up here, maybe I'll do it right there on the edge so you can see everything. I've got 48 thousandths of movement. Total movement, on, on, uh, not total movement, but 48 thousandths. My total movement was 76 thousandths. Right? And I know that on this side, 48 thousandths would fill that gap because as I move the diff case that direction, then I move it this direction, the only thing that keeps it from moving any further that way is the pinion. So if I put a 48 thousandths shim on this side, I would fill that gap up and there'd be no looseness. And then the difference between these two 
which is 28 thousandths. If I put a 28 thousandths, oops, 0, 2, 8, on this side, I would fill that gap up. Because 28 and 48, 48 and 28 equal 76. So that would fill up this gap. It would take up all the, the preload, or it would have no preload, but it would also have no backlash, right? Because this, this amount of, when I, when I filled it up with 48 here and then I put a 28 there, I wouldn't, I'd just be pushing the gear up towards the pinion. I wouldn't have backlash. And these two numbers just make up the clearance that I have in there. So I need to add backlash. Uh, and I also need to add preload. If I want to add preload, what do I do? Using the numbers we used yesterday, if we added four thousandths to each side, then if I jammed a 32 thousandths shim on the pinion side and a 52 thousandths shim on the ring gear side, I'd have an axle that didn't have backlash, but it had preload. So then that, that we're getting there, we're getting closer. Now I need to add, add some backlash. So I've got a preloaded diff case using these numbers, but I don't have any backlash. So what do I need to do that? I need to move the ring gear away from the pinion. So I subtract six thousandths from this side, shooting for six thousandths backlash. And I add that six thousandths that I took out from the ring side, and I add it to the pinion side. So by taking six out from here and putting it over there, I've moved that ring gear over six thousandths, and I should have backlash with preload. So my overall numbers, if the math all turned out accurately, I should have 40, four th uh, 46 thousandths, oops, two zero there, 46 thousandths size shim on this side, and on this side, I should have a 38 thousandths shim. Whew, there's some serious brain math action going there. Okay, so this is the whole purpose of these dummy bearings, is to figure these numbers out and uh, be able to do that without having to print and, and put shims in there and get an idea of what shims I need in there without having to put um, the bearings on and press them on and off. Now here's something that you might be thinking about. What if, okay, let me switch the tripod view, so. What if you're just Scott Pavlonis and you're trying to do an axle in your driveway or something like that, or Justin Crebo getting ready to put a Dana 44 in or Dana 60, yeah, let's go 60, might as well make a, a nice big axle. And you got this Dana apart and you're like, man, I'll do all this dummy bearing, all this stuff. If you aren't changing your differential case, um, you, you already know when you take these, well, for one, you could just keep these together. You, you, you organize your shims properly. Um, if you are changing your differential case, you're going to need to have some kind of a starting point. Um, and because if, you, if you're pressing those, those if the shims live between the diff case and the bearings and you have to press these things on, you're going to want to get close. I would probably take my differential case and I'd try to figure out a way to see if maybe by laying it on a flat surface, putting a straight edge across this and seeing if the height if the actual from bearing surface to bearing surface, the, the, the ledge that these ride on, if my new, dif new differential case is the same as my old one. It should be, because they're all manufactured and machined to these uh, tolerances. But if, they're, if they are, then at least I know I can use the total thickness from side to side. If I added them up, I should be using that total, the same total thickness to start with. And you might be able to measure from a flat surface up to this surface to figure out where that is in, in relationship to your old one to figure out if you need to tweak the shims that you had on one side versus the other. Otherwise, it's a guessing game. Honestly, what I would do, I would spend the time to take the old bearings, glue these together, grind the inside out, make my own dummy bearing set so that way I can just do the same measurement that you see in front of you. Or if you're rich, you can just go ahead and um, buy the tool kit. I myself like to kind of figure out ways to make the tools. Okay, going at these shims, we're going to see if we can't figure this out. These shims come in combinations of three thousandths, five thousandths, ten thousandths, and thirty thousandths. So you probably could come up with a, a way to make 38, but I'm going to just be lazy and we'll try to do 39. So I'm going to try to find three tens 
and three threes. Actually, a 38 would be easy. We would be three tens, a three, and a five. And this is a three. I'm going to drop these all over again a bit. This is a five, so now all I know is need is three tens. There's one ten. These, this one's a ten, I think. Nope. Let's see if I've got some. Oh, you know what? I got a 30, I think, right here. Look at that. 30 plus a 5 plus a 3, 38. So I got the shim combination that I need for this side right here. These shims are used, this one's got a little bend to it because where they sit on this differential case, since it's trapped there, there's a little, uh, like a radius there. So I'll probably make sure that that is flexed in that same direction. And then we'll put the bearing on and hopefully that will be good. All right, and then on this side, I need 46. So I'm gonna start out with the 30 again. I think I had another one of those over here. 30, find a 10. There's a 10, so I got 40. And then two threes, 46. Look at that, I was able to get exactly what my numbers told me to put in there. Now hopefully this will work right. Doing this live, unrehearsed, that's usually a recipe for disaster. This will not drop in here easily. Um, I will put this on the boom to show this. Some of you guys might be looking going, what are these holes here for? Oh, let me put it on the boom first. These holes right here, what are those things for? Well, they actually, there might be more than one purpose for them, but the, uh, they make axle spreaders. They're these little uh, square things that you fit on top of these axle housings. And when you use the spreader, you can actually open this axle housing up a bit. There's a picture of it right there. And they want you to put a dial indicator on it because when you start spreading this thing open, they don't want you to go more than 15 thousandths of an inch or else you can distort this housing. I don't use a spreader, never use a spreader. We do have them here. Uh, I was told years ago that don't let the, you're better off trying to figure out a way to not use them because A, most people don't have them. B, most people that do have them ruin the, different, the axle housings because they get carried away. So this is one of those things. I get my fingers in here. That's probably dangerous. I could chop them off. But like I said, I like to live life a little dangerously. You see how I have these kind of tapered in there? And I'm staring at it and it's centered. Okay. I got them kind of angled in there. They're not going in there straight. I can see the bearings a little bit on this side. I've done that on purpose because I'm going to try to wedge these things in there. If I try to go straight, they just won't fit because I'm going to try to fit something that's wider into an area that's narrower. So I have to kind of try to get the little wedgy effect going there. This might sound abusive and brutal, but it's not going to hurt anything. I'm going to use uh, my little softy hammer here. And I'm, gonna, I'm making sure I'm centered over those saddles as well as possible. But I'm going to go ahead and try to tap these things in. It kind of fell in a little too quick on me, I think. It's, it's a kind of a bear at times, but okay, it, I can tell right now the preload feels a little low, but it's not, it's not failing the jiggle test. If I put my fingers on it, no, I'm, I'm probably okay though. But if I can't hear it go click, 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 jiggle then I'm probably good. Um, but I do have backlash. Before I check it, I'm gonna to wanna to tighten my bearing caps up because that might actually draw it together a little bit better. Checking my marks. My H is horizontal on this side. Tighten this up. You don't have to get carried away and torque these things down um, if you just uh, 
snug them down with the ratchet. As long as you know the metal's pulled together. I usually try to avoid torquing these parts down until I'm done. Um, after I do this, Mike, don't let me forget because I uh, want to show this interference fit on that because I, I went ahead and took a differential case from the closet and it's got a, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're going to go through and pull the ringer off because I know that we didn't really do that on these and that's kind of doing partial job in a sense. But um, the, and then I, we can put that ring gear in the cookie oven and get it warmed up because we'll show you how it's an interference fit and it does not go on unless you uh, press it in or pound it in. And I'm not a big fan of pounding these parts in because you don't want to distort or warp the differential case. All right, so I'm snugging these up, maybe 30 foot pounds just to pull it together. Ooh, still got, it's, the backlash is tight, but it, there is a little bit there. Um, dial indicator, it's over here. We'll measure it. I'm going to guess that the backlash is only a couple thousandths of an inch. When I tighten it up, it lowered the, the caps down there. So, two thousands. Let me move it in a couple spots. This is one of those things where still two thousands. So, my math did not work out perfectly. I'm two thousands. And we'll go ahead and spin around and check my preload. My preload is pretty close, I bet, because just by the feel of it, but I might be a little low. Well, actually, it's not bad. I'm getting about 34. I'm about four thousandths um, or four inch pounds higher than total um, or pinion by itself. Pinion by itself was 30, and if you remembered, the equation was side bearing preload. It was side bearing preload is total preload of the whole thing minus pinion preload times the axle ratio, and that should be between 15 and 35 inch pounds. My total was 34. My pinion by itself was 30. So I got four, th four inch pounds difference. Multiply that by the axle ratio. This is 410. So four times 4.1, we're looking at 16.4, which just barely makes that threshold. Now, if I'm going to go through and finish this off, um, I'm going to want to increase my backlash a little bit. But while I'm in there, like say if I, I, can, I have two ways to increase my backlash, I can take shims out of this side and put it over here. Usually it's a one-to-one -one relationship. And, or I could just put more shims on this side, and that will force the ring gear away from the pinion a little bit and add some of that preload. Or I could do a combination. I can do maybe take that uh, three thousandths out of this side, put it over there, uh, and put a five over there. That's what I'm going to do. We'll, we'll try that real quick. Um, okay, but before I do that, I'm going to go with my promise here, and we're going to get that ring gear cooking. It won't take long. Mike, if you show this, I went ahead and pulled these ring gear bolts out on this. These are left-handed thread bolts. They don't have any indication on the back. These are the bolts right there. Oh, let's see if I can't. Be blurry. Yeah, it's not focusing in. Is it? There we go. They're grade eight bolts, but they don't have an L. So if you have your impact on there and you go to the brrr, try to zap that thing in reverse, and it's not coming off quickly, flip it to tighten, your impact to tighten, and it'll probably blast them off. Most, I don't know what percentage it is. This is a GM um, diff case, but a lot of them are, you know, that's left-hand thread. These are left-hand thread. So just be aware. Also, if you know you need to change these ring gear bolts, don't expect to just go to the hardware store 
and, and find new ring gear bolts because they're left hand thread and they're grade eight and they're, they're, they're kind of specialty things. So this is the press fit. All these bolts are out. It's an interference fit, not so much a press fit. Come on. It's like, it's like Mike, can you hold this? <laughs> Sometimes you can clamp these in a vise. Um, not the uh, important parts, of course. I think it's coming. Most of them using a brass drift. I'm not using uh, anything that's going to mar up the surface. Okay, so now there's my diff case without the gear on it. And then here's my gear. So this is, they do not, as you saw, they don't drop in there um, flush. This opening is a little bit smaller than the actual ledge that it sits on. So if this is a new one. I'm going to go ahead and put it in my oven here. You want to preheat this uh oh, what the heck's in there? Cookies are done? <laughs> yeah. Well that's where that gear's been. Looking for that thing. Actually I haven't but That's from a Honda six speed. Okay, so where were we at? Okay, so we got that off. So now I'm gonna go through and do my shim change. Give that a little bit of time, let that heat up, and we will see if we can't get that to expand enough to just drop onto that differential case. And what I decided here is I was gonna take three thousandths off on this side and put five thousandths on that side. Now this is an example. I used these tools and it didn't get what I needed. Um, it, they got me close. It got me, really it got me on the low end of the spec for preload and it gave me two thousandths of backlash, but it's not enough. So here's one of those situations that if I spent the extra time, the few extra minutes to go through and, zet, and, and grind some reliefs to get underneath those um, side bearings, I spent that extra time to get the grind in the differential case and release to get under the side bearings to pull them off. I'd be reaping those rewards because I have to pull this stuff back off and I don't want to destroy my bearing. It is in there tight enough to the point where I'll have to go back with my wrench. And uh, oh, the ring gear bolt wasn't tight. Um, and I'll have to spin this diff case out. Wrong way. Okay, let's spun that out. I saw yesterday that somebody watched it. I don't remember who it was. Mike McKay, maybe? Somebody said, I used that trick just the, after I watched the video. So somebody got a benefit from it, which is awesome. This was, uh, okay, so this is the one I wanted to add five to. Got my mix of stuff here. That's, that's big. Let's see what size this is. That's five. And then this is the side. I was going to take one of these three thousands jobbers out, right? Yeah, there. Okay. Now. If it was only that easy in the vehicle, because like I said, you'd have to get a two jaw puller if you created your um, reliefs to get those out. Get those out. See if I can do it without losing a finger. Imagine doing this horizontal because the it would be in the vehicle, possibly. Might be a little harder to get it in because I'll have a, an additional two thousandths 
preload that I'll be fighting. Kind of just drops in there like if you had your finger in the wrong spot it could be a trip to the emergency room. This is where the case spreader give you a little bit of room. But I'm not doing any damage. I just keep telling that to myself. All right, push that in and I've got my horizontal H, horizontal H. I shifted them to the side so it should be good. I've, had, I've heard of techs uh, when they struggle with preload, not understanding it, but like it, it might be tight and then loose and it's just like, what's, why is this changing around? Once they have these things tight, sometimes they'll tap all around where the bearings go with the ball part of a ball peen hammer and the vibration kind of jiggles parts and, and uh, hel helps them find their center or their seat in case they're just kind of slightly bound up in there. The interesting thing is with these axles, if, if you set this up and you've got 30 inch pounds on your pinion and 35 on your total by the time it's done and everything's good, you drive the thing a thousand miles, if you took it back apart, half of that preload will go away because uh, it's once these bearings kind of burn in and seat in, they are pretty much better. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll seat in and, and have a, uh, a better um, mesh. Five thousandths. I'm right at the minimum of the spec. Which honestly, I, if the spec is 35 uh, or 5 to 8 thousandths, which these are, I like to go to the minimum of the spec. Five. Good enough. So I'm going to spin around and double check my preload. And I should see it a little higher than, I mean, all I've done is add another two thousandths uh, of, of shim thickness. And I'm getting 30, I'm going to see 40, 50, it's going to be about 36. And so while I'm moving, I'm seeing it going up to the 36. So now, using my side bearing preload, um, Mike, you could probably show me. Using my side bearing preload, I was using the uh, pinion, the, the total preload was 36, pinion was 30, uh, 36 minus 30 is 6 times the axle ratio, which is 4.1. 6 times 4 is 24, plus, you know, so 20, um, 24 and a half. That's right in the middle of the spec. So this axle is set up great. Now all we have to do is a contact pattern, and hopefully, if our pattern's good, we're done. And with an additional 5,000 shim, we should see the pattern move a little bit more towards the flank. 5,000 is in a, a whole bunch, so it might make this pattern look even better because I still kind of think it was all set towards the uh, face a little bit. That might have just been the nature of this gear, though. Flat rate for overhauling these. I haven't looked it up in a while, but usually... Not much. I'm going to guess maybe at most four hours. And it's done in the vehicle. Uh, it, and if it's under warranty, you're probably got two and a half hours. You know, the dealer techs kind of get screwed on that. They assume that because they, they're working in the shop, things that are under warranty have low mileage, that they're, it's going to be, um, it's gonna be uh, easier for them to, to work on. And also, they're going to be super familiar with everything, so they'll uh, get it done quicker. That is true, probably, in some cases, but some things just take a, take a bit of time. So using, like, the standard labor rate, you're probably going to get four hours. So that's the reason why you want to do what you can to get it set up right the first time, because um, it doesn't pay to really take it apart and do it multiple times. Going one direction, flip my ratchet, and provide resistance in the other direction.
Ah, see now this pattern looks better. So I think I was right. It was a little more towards the face. And with that added five thousandths, where'd my mouse go? With that added five thousandths, oh, here it is, way over there. It made it better. Let me get the boom going. Would the other pattern have worked? I still think it would have. I think it would have been fine. Um, I think this pattern's better though. So it goes to show you, the tools do a good job, but they're not perfect. That's the reason why, and I've mentioned it a zillion times, I recommend uh, using the original shim. Because they spent the time at the factory, and they had it all set up, and if it had a high mileage unit, and all you're doing is a gear ratio change, trust the pinion depth shim that's in there. Use it. It, it. It'll give you a better starting point. If you have no idea if this thing was set up properly, or you got a new housing and you got to start from somewhere, use the tools. Because it's going to get you a good starting point. You can see it actually asked for a 45 with the minus 2 pinion in here. We, we, they say put a 43 in there. That gave us this contact pattern. Well, I kind of rolled over it so it looks better now. But it was off a little bit more towards the face. If you rewound the video all the way back to the beginning, you'd see it looked a little shinier towards the face. Now, we went ahead and did it ourselves, and I said, let's go ahead and add 5,000 more shim. And you could see what happened is it moved this little bit. Oh, okay, thank you. As you can see, it moved it now more towards the flank. You could actually see it's a more of an oval shape to it. If my backlash was excessive, I'd see that it'd be like coming off way back here. Like I'll try to wipe off like that. It'll look like that. It'd be shiny off, running right off the heel of the tooth. If my backlash is too tight, it would probably look exactly like the good pattern that we're seeing here. You can't use contact pattern to tell you your backlash is off. You can let it tell you that your backlash is too much, but you should have been able to figure that out just by measuring it. But if your backlash is too tight, it's still going to look like this. So don't even do a contact pattern unless you're within spec. Just adjust your backlash until it's within spec, then do a contact pattern. The reason why um, I also mention that is because your spec on this is five to eight thousandths. If you set it at eight thousandths and you saw this pattern, psh, run with it. This is good. It's already offset towards the toe. It's fine. Now, if you ran it, if you had it at eight thousandths and this pattern was showing way back here, like towards the middle of the tooth, towards the heel, but it didn't even know if it didn't run off the tooth, if it's offset towards the heel, I would go back in, even though you're within spec and backlash, I would go ahead and move it to five thousandths because it's already starting to drift off the heel and it's only going to get greater over time. So don't use a contact pattern to tell you that backlash is too tight. You can see it, uh, it's, it's helpful to know if it's too loose. Use a contact pattern primarily to tell if your pinion is, is in the right spot. If it's towards the flank, the pinion's too close to the ringer center line. If it's towards the face, which is towards the top of the tooth, it's too far away from the ringer center line. Um, Sometimes they don't move straight up, face flank. They might go diagonal. So if you know your backlash is good, I'm going to like wipe some more off on this one here. Like let's say your backlash is good, but you see a pattern that looks to the face and off to the heel, it's still probably your pinion depth because it kind of moved it off to the face diagonally. But the big thing is that heel versus... Um, you know, like if it's off towards the face, that's a pinion depth problem. If it's off towards the heel, that's a backlash problem. I also like to use the terms. Um, I like to use the terms in reference to the ringer center line. I don't like to say it's too deep or too shallow because that's, you know, what are you saying when you say deep or shallow? I don't know. I mean, this is this a swimming pool, so I don't know if, uh, if it's too deep, then does that mean the pinion's sitting too far away? If I say the pinion's too close to the ring gear center line, there's no way to mistake that. If I say the pinion's too far away from the ring gear center line, no way to mistake that. You could also say what you have to do to, to fix it. Like this looks like it needs a thicker pinion shim, or this needs a thinner pinion shim. A thinner pinion shim would move it further away from the ring gear center line, and a thicker pinion shim would move it closer to the ring gear center line. So try to think in those terms. 
But right now we got an axle that we put together. It, it's working. It looks like it'll work well. I don't know if um, I'm heated up enough on my ring gear yet to, to do that. So there were a few things that we were going to, I was going to try to address and trying to remember what they were. Contact patterns. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can. Any questions thus far from anybody? Yeah, you guys have any questions? Because we're kind of moving through this and about done. Um, the jiggle theory, it's that putting your fingers on there, see if it goes click, click, click. I can walk around on all the axles in the lab right now that are sitting out, and I can tell if the side bearing preload is good just by putting my hand on there and jiggling it. If it doesn't jiggle, I know I might have too much preload, but I know I, um, I, I don't have zero. Should have to grab that and physically move the diff case back and forth. Hopefully you understand the idea of preload and that little 2x4 demonstration might have helped. Um, yeah, that's probably about it. Why don't we just say, I'm going to try. I don't know how long that's been heating in there. It's a big chunk of metal, so it takes it a while to expand, you know, absorb all that heat and expand. But we'll see if it's been in there long enough. I'll grab my oven mitts. Oh, here's something that we can mention real quick, too. This right here, this differential case, somebody asked yesterday, how do you, do you ever take this apart? Actually, there's two things that somebody mentioned. Somebody said, what do you do when this pin breaks? And that is a real common uh, failure on these GM vehicles. Seems to be just a GM thing. But this pinion shaft pin is retained by this bolt. Um, it's, you can see it's right there. Goes through the differential case and uh, threads into the differential case and it retains this. What happens is there, this, maybe this um, hole gets a little egg shaped and the pin rocks back and forth or twists, but very common is these pins break right here. And it's not broke, like, because you'll go to take this out, you'll go to take this pin out, and you have to, by the way, to get the axle shafts out. So you go to take this pin out, and when you pull it out, it only has, has it's only there from here up. The pin's still stuck in there. And you can even see where that's worn. See the shiny spot? That is, um, that's because of this pin kind of working on that surface in there. So this pin will sometimes break and you will take it out and you'll only have half of it and you'll have the pin stuck in there. And you're like, how do I get that pin out? So there is a couple ways that people do it. The, the way you don't do it is you don't take a, a big, you know, bar or something and beat the crap out of it and shear it off because you'll break the differential case. If you plan on doing that, plan on buying a differential case. Uh, there, the, the one way that people, um, there, there's a tool, and I should have grabbed it. I think I have it. I probably don't know where it's at, so it doesn't really matter. But um, it's a long drill bit that's left-handed. It's opposite cut, reverse cut. And it's big enough to the point where, you zoom out. My, well, you might have to zoom out. Imagine this has got that pin in it, and it's broken off. You can, it's, it's a long drill bit, and it actually has a guide. I've made one of them before, and it, and it does work. Basically, you take, since this part is broken, it has a hole drilled right through the middle of this, and you put it in there, and you use this long drill bit as a guide, and you can actually drill into the, the shank of that, and then it usually will actually, because it's reverse cut, it'll spin it out. And if you look for, I don't know, if you Googled or go on Amazon, and you put like GM diff pin drill, I'm sure it would show up. Another way, and I've had to do this, and it works fine. Um, I, I, the first time I tried this, I didn't think it was going to work because I was desperate and I was just didn't have any other way to do it. I sprayed the hell out of this, this little gap right through here and inside this hole with brake clean. I just hosed it down. And the idea was to get all the, the oil that I could out of there. Because the thing is, when these break off, it's not because anything seized in there. This thing was probably broken in there for 100,000 miles. This thing flexed this pin back and forth so much, it broke the bolt, and there's because these are sharp cuts, uh, sharp machining grooves that they have on the threads. So it's just basically caught by maybe half of a thread in there. So if you clean all the oil out in there, blow a lot of compressed air, get everything out, 
you can go in there with a pick, a straight pick that's sharp, and just sit there and, and turn it counterclockwise and just keep turning it and keep turning it and keep turning it, and it will thread itself out. I've never not gotten one out that way. We have bought the drill before just to show it, but I've always been able to get it out, and people probably think I'm a liar and all that stuff, but I've, I've always done it. But you can't abuse it first. You can't start hitting things and drilling things and all that stuff because now you're going to make it kind of wedged in there. You got to start out by hosing it down and then go in there and just work it. It might take five minutes, but it'll come out. Um, this design right here does not use a bolt. It actually has a roll pin. It's like a, you know, a normal one that you'd punch in. And you can't, on the Dana, you can't actually get these gears out without taking the diff, diff case off and taking the ring gear off. Because if you look, the pin is overlapping, or the ring gear is overlapping the pin. The pin won't come out without taking the ring gear off. So, yeah, that was that. And also a question came up yesterday is, when you rebuild these, is there anything that you check? This one's worn out. You can actually see, I can take the side gear. See how much movement I have up and down? That is no good. You can hear it, um, and you can see it. And I'll, I'll move up close to this camera. It has got pit marks all over these gear teeth. Right there. If I caught the light and the focus right, maybe I'll switch to the camera boom and see if you can see it better that way. Um, it is torn up. Yeah, you can see them right there. So this would be a gear set, and they're, they're all bad and galled up. This one's got the worst of it, but so this gear set, you need new diff gears in it. This would be, this is loose enough to the point where you would have a lot of clunking going on there. Every time you accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, you'd hear a clunk, or if you put it in gear and then you put it in reverse, it's boom, boom, it takes up all that slack. A lot of people think when they hear a clunk when they shift into reverse that it is the ring and pinion backlash. Usually the ring and pinion backlash is fine. If, the, if there is that much backlash where it actually create a big old clunk, you're gonna have gear whine and your pattern's gonna be way off. But, um, so usually if you're hearing a lot of clunk between drive and reverse, it's looseness in all these other places like the pin to the uh, diff case, maybe the actual um, side gears. Uh, it could be the U-joints. It could be a high idle. And then when you drop into gear, it takes up all that slack immediately. So... All right, Mike, should we... They oh. would like to go over the math again. The math, okay. For the Dana on... Yep. Okay. On the side bearing? Probably. I didn't say, but I would say so. Okay, so we'll do the math again. No problem. That's why we're doing this live, so that way if you have some question it we can jump in here and, and talk about it because when you watch a video that's just up there and you have a question, you gotta work through uh, you know, comments and all that and that's not usually ideal. You're, you're thinking about it, your brain's in that move, uh, mode, so. Okay, yeah, boom. I moved my cordless mouse over here, probably shouldn't have. All right, so I am going to try to show the axle housing and the table there a little bit because I can draw on the table. Let's go through and we're going to have to pretend since we already did all this stuff and, and I'll use the numbers if I can remember them. But remember when we went in here with the differential case without the pinion in there, we got movement. Total movement was 77. Um, I'm off the screen. No, that was good. Total movement was 76 thousandths of an inch. So that was the total movement. If I didn't do anything but stuff the 76,000 shim on one side, I'd have a differential case that would be in the housing with no preload. Then I went in with my pinion. My pinion sitting in there, and now I went back with my differential case, and now I moved it again. I'm not going to get the same amount of movement because the amount of movement I did the first time without the pinion that was in there, I didn't have anything interrupting the side-to-side -side motion that I had. So I was able to get the full motion, which was 76 thousandths. 
When I put the pinion in there, and now I'm getting the movement side to side, when I go this way, I hit the differential house or the axle housing, but when I go that way, the ring gear hits the pinion. So I don't get as much movement. And I'm going off memory, but with pinion installed, pinion, um, the movement I got was, I think, was it 48 thousandths? It was 48. Yeah. Right, so then at this point, I'm like, okay, I got 48 thousandths with the pinion installed, and I got 76 with it out, or with, the, with the pinion out. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and draw down here like I did before. If I put a 48 thousandths shim on this side, because this is the side that had uh, 48 when I went from the housing to the pinion gear to the housing and the pinion gear. If I put 48 on this side, I'd fill that gap up. And the difference between these two are 28 thousandths, if I put the 28 thousandths on this side, I'd have an, an axle with the pinion and ring gear installed with no preload and no backlash, 48 and 28. And so that, that's good, but that's not where we're at. Let me raise these numbers up a little bit. So 48 and 28. And like, I'm gonna go ahead and um, change colors because everything that I've got up here in black is this example. It's, a, it's this axle, uh, I'm, I'm not going to circle, I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, it's this axle housing. It's, uh, it, it could be different with every axle. If we had 10 axle housings out here, we could get 10 different combinations of numbers. But these next ones I'm going to write in green, hopefully green shows up on this table okay, are basically the numbers that we're always going to use regardless of the axle. We're always going to add four thousandths to each side for preload. So if I take the amount of shims, 76 thousandths total, and I add, you know, in this case I had 48 and 28. If I add four thousandths to each side, now I have 84 thousandths total, a 52 on this side and a 32 on this side, and I'm that applied that pressure on those bearings. That's squeezing these bearings. That's for preload. Preload. I'm going to put PL on this side because I don't have enough room. And four thousandths, like I said, I wrote that in green because that, I don't care if this is a GM or a Ford or uh, whatever, you're going to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and write down. This is, um, in this case, since we're using, I'm going to just keep it in green, 52 thousandths and then 32 thousandths. Right? Now, I would have, if I did that, I'd have an axle that theoretically would have the right amount of preload, but it wouldn't have the right amount of backlash. So I need to move my ring gear away from the drive pinion. So I'll take whatever shims I have here, 52 thousandths, and I'd subtract six thousandths from that. But I don't want to just take it away and not put anything in on this side because I would reduce my preload by doing that. So I want to take the six thousandths from this side and move it over to this side. So I would go plus zero zero six, plus zero zero six, and that gives me to my final number, which I should have fifty-eight thousandths total on this side, and thirty-eight total on that side. I don't think that was the shim combination I had before, though, is it? Oh, oh I, dang it! I did that backwards. Rewind that last minute. <laughs> I did it backwards. Subtract 6,000. I think I said it right, but I wrote it down wrong. Um, we'll have to review that and see if I, what I did. Because I got to move the, the, the ring gear away from the pinion, so I need to subtract 6,000 on this side and put 6. So I subtract 6, and that would give me 46,000. And that sounds, yeah, that was what I had before. And then adding 6,000 to that side, I'd have 30. Eight. And that is what I had. Those are my overall shims. So I put the 46 on this side and the 38 on that side. When I bolt it up, then I'm ready to go uh, and uh, install this or do a contact pattern if it's good. And if you remember, it, it wasn't perfect. I ended up having to subtract another, because I, I, my preload was on the low side of the spec and my backlash was only 2,000. So what I ended up doing 
was actually subtracting another three thousandths on this side and adding five thousandths on that side, and then it came out pretty much perfect. So hopefully that cleared up that math. Um, and I know it's just in the perfect world right now, uh, if you guys would be doing this instead of me doing it. But I'm hoping that if you're able to pay attention and stay focused this long, you're able to kind of work through my hands in a sense. You're seeing it from front to back, and I think that is helpful, as opposed to following along in a worksheet, doing small sections. And even on the videos on, uh, that we have on the lectures, that I do go through this whole process, but it's broken up into more of a theory. And this is seeing it from start to finish, I think could still be beneficial. It's probably the next best, best thing to lab, that, at least that I can think of at this point. Um, so what do you think, Mike? Do you think that uh, cookie oven's warm enough? Hopefully the cookies are done. <laughs> yeah. They're requesting chocolate chip. On <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I wish I could have some of that. So this is going to be a quick action. I'm going to go in there, barehanded, grab a 200. No, I'm not going to do the barehanded. But, um, Welding gloves, I'm going to grab it, come over here. What I would normally have are a couple of these ring gear bolts handy because once it tightens up on there, once it tightens up on there, I'm not going to be able to move it. So I'll look at it, drop it down, and I'll start some of those. I've seen where from the manufacturer, they actually use a press. And if you remember that ring gear, it had like a lip around the inside of it. And they have these little... Um, shells if you will that they lay the ring gear on there they have they put instead of bolts in they have these guides they're just smooth so they fit perfectly through these holes and then they lay the ring gear with those guides in and they they go in through the ring gear uh, the openings in the diff case and then they use this big looks like a big pipe but it's you know fits on the inside of that ring gear and then psh, they just use a, a pneumatic press and just pushes it on nice and even in since we don't have something like that and they don't really sell those things, um, the, your options are is to get the ring gear under here, start it with a few threads and work your way in. But you know, you're doing a lot of twisting and torquing. I don't think that's a good way to do it. And the other option is to heat it up and let it drop in and then work quick. So even an old man like me might be able to make it happen. If an old man like me can work quick enough to do it, then I think you guys can too. Also, in the real world, you want this to be nice and clean with no crap on it. I see there's like some garbage on that. But this isn't going in a vehicle. We're not worried about that. So far, other than me spilling the shims out and then talking when the camera's not aiming on me, things have gone well. So maybe this will be the part that fails miserably on me. All right. Hot, 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 hot. Dropped right in. Don't forget that it's reverse thread. With it reverse thread, don't sit there for five minutes going righty tighty because it won't work. And I'm just spinning around. It, it dropped right in there. And I'm putting as many bolts as I can in before it cools off because it's going to transfer heat to the diff case. Diff case is going to expand and the ring gear is going to cool off. And then when that happens, it tightens up on it and you're done. But you can see it worked well. I've got all the bolts in it. It is, um, the aroma is great. I mean, it's, it's making me very hungry. So I don't know if you guys like the smell of cooked gear lube and contact pattern paint like I do, but all right. So I was able to get all the bolts started and it's sitting flat so there's really no chance of distortion and i'm good other than that i'm trying to think if there's anything else service wise setup wise that i can explain help explain for you to you guys um all right if you have any other questions let me know uh, I will mention, if you guys are still online here, the ones that are probably still watching this are probably my students in my class. Think about this. You guys are freshmen. You might consider, this is kind of fun, videoing, and I got OBS. We got some nice cameras here. And um, we got this facility here that's just got incredible stuff, right? We've got hundreds of vehicles, hundreds of components. You guys are learning great things. That we, I, I've, I've got this live streaming groups. Some of you guys might be part of it. 
where you go through, and this is kind of the idea, not necessarily a two hour live stream, but going through smaller segments, like showing some kind of technology or something like that, and streaming it up just like we're doing here at live to Facebook and YouTube. It kind of worked out great. We got this equipment from an internal grant from SIU, and um, now we have it. So under these circumstances, it's pretty awesome that uh, we're able to share this stuff live Otherwise, I don't know if we would really be able to do it. And if we did, it wouldn't be as high quality, I don't think. Um, but consider when we come back in the fall, uh, joining in on doing some of these live streams. You guys will do it as, uh, as a class or as a group instead of I'm not going to be sitting there hovering over you, making you do things left and right. I, I basically, I give you some ideas. You come up with some ideas. You, you share with me what you're going to do. Um, I might help you tweak it, make it better, tell you some things that, uh, options that, we, that you might not realize that we have that we can do, and then you rehearse it, and then boom, we go live. And uh, it's a lot of fun. The, stu the students that are doing it are enjoying it uh, this semester, and I'd like to kind of keep going every semester thereafter, so. Free to work the Chicago Auto Show. Yeah, exactly, the Chicago Auto Show. We, we went up there and um, went live a couple times and looked at some of the technology. And um, it's a lot of fun. I think you guys, the students, and this is the other thing. If you notice now, more than ever, all over the internet, people are like, online training here, webinar training there, this and that, and the next thing. The, when I applied for the grant for this, the reason why I got it is I pointed out that the world is moving to an online format. Uh, manufacturers, if you go to Dealer Connect right now, and you go to a new vehicle, uh, Dealer Connect is Chrysler's service information. You go pick a 2019 Dodge Ram. Over there in the service portal, there's a, there's a column that says videos. And they'll show you all these little things that they're doing, and they create their videos. So Chrysler's doing it from the factory side. So think of you guys, the students, that have the technical knowledge. If you get some of the video experience, you would just open up another opportunity for employment for you guys. Uh, it's all good experience. Not only do you learn the content better, but you also gain another skill, and it's kind of fun. And the work that you do lives on. It stays up on YouTube, gets shared around. It just doesn't get lost in a presentation that you do for one class or something like that. So think about that. It's a little sales pitch there, uh, but I am going to, I'll pay attention to the comments if you have any questions. We are gonna stream some more next week. It'll be on manual transmissions, and we'll put some more stuff up there throughout this, uh, uh, this outage, I guess you can call it, you know, where you guys can't come in to the program because of the COVID-19 stuff.